Uh, I, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me, and my task is really to uh, uh, address some of the issues about polycystic ovary syndrome. And just a word of caution that I would prefer PCOS rather than PCOD to be addressed because we, as an international group, do not like it to be called a disease, but a syndrome. So my task is to help unravel the multiple clinical issues that particularly primary care physicians would come across in their day-to-day -day activities uh, when they see these patients. And this is a photograph of 7th century AD um, ladies damsels from Sri Lanka, and I'm sure at that time they did not have overt features of PCOS. Nevertheless, I'll start with a case, his case history of a, whom I would like to term Miss Sri Lanka, uh, who is 16 years, about to sit her ordinary level examinations. As you know, the Asian kids are kind of encouraged by their mothers in particular to study for exams, and therefore it's a very stressful period. And she has irregular periods, and as you can see, she has attained menarche at a very young age of 10. And she has had no periods for eight months, and then that has been followed by heavy bleeding. Her GP has treated her with tablets for four weeks to control the bleeding. And she has also been noted to have gained 10 kilograms in the past two years. And like what Dr. Manodi said, all those differential diagnoses have to go through your mind, and her current BMI by Asian standards is way over the top. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, she has oligoamenorrhea and dysfunctional uterine bleeding with excessive weight gain. And therefore, I'd like to pose to you the possible causes for you to just think about and retain in your memory. But she also has hirsutism. And this is the thick, curly, dark brown hair in the male pattern of distribution, of upper lip, chin, and upper and lower abdomen and thighs, rather than the forearms and the legs which is not considered in the ferryman galway score. She has some facial acne, which any adolescent could have, but she also has loss of capital hair, particularly on the temporal, uh, temporal aspects. So she, the mother complains that there are dark skin tags on the, her neck, and there are also, the doctor notes, uh, dark patches, which I'll show you, share with you, not only in the standard areas, but also even on the knuckles and nasolabial folds. So overall, she has hyperandrogenism and acanthosis, nigricans, and you need to take this entire picture together of her menstrual problems, as well as these metabolic features, to consider as to whether this is PCOS. And I'd like to point out that the phenotype of PCOS has no unique phenotype. It can be very wide and varied. And even in a given woman, over time, it can vary. And from an international point of view, the Rotterdam criteria says it's any two of these three, that is oligoanovulation or oligoaminuria, hyperandrogenism, which can be clinical and or biochemical, and the polycystic ovary which again has been qualified in a more, by the volume as number of follicles in the entire ovary or in a plane. But it's very important to note that you need to exclude other etiologies. And that includes most of the things that Manodi spoke about. And therefore, we have to get like a very appropriate history, particularly whether she has been on steroids. Because even the uh, native treatments can be laced with steroids, as we know, so we need to take that into account, as well as treatment for bronchial asthma. As to whether she had galacteria, whether she had facial features as was so aptly shown, and of course if she was wearing rings and shoes, the sizes have to change. Whether she has been on antidepressants, which very often is not made evident, and they cause metabolic syndrome, and whether the GP treated her with metformin, because sometimes uh, the parents uh, may not really come out with these unless you really ask specific questions. And both the, her parents have had the metabolic syndrome, as you heard at the oration. Those are very important uh, indicators that this woman also is likely to be at risk. So here she is, Miss Sri Lanka. She has acanthosis, she's hyperandrogenic, but you can see she has good breast development, which basically means that she has 
uh, good estrogens, despite the hyperandrogenism. And from her point of view, she has problems with her menses, her cosmetics, her weight, exam stress, and she's asking what's wrong with me. And therefore, we need to look as to whether this is virilization rather than just hirsutism. So you have to look at the clitoris, whether we have to think of hypertension and other features which suggest Cushing's. Thyroid, as of course, hypothyroid will have to be very gross to get into this kind of situation. But you can have subclinical hypothyroidism occurring with PCOS as well as acanthosis, which is very striking, hirsutism, which we can score, and any score over eight is considered significant, and the acne, as I mentioned, with normal breasts, and it's important to check the ocular uh, uh, fields, as visual fields, and look at the fundus to look for any hyper, uh, any kind of mass lesion. So as I said, she's, she's having lots of problems and also her mother and family pressures are there. So she's very vulnerable to depression, anxiety, and we need to keep this in mind as PCOS is a lifelong condition. And just as much as her presentation, we need to bear in mind the evolution of metabolic disease and her long-term prospects. And we need to also bear in mind that menstrual problems can be an issue when it comes to menarche because menarche, you give at least two years for the cycles to become very regular. So we need to keep that in mind when managing these patients. So diagnosis takes quite long. And as you can note, it can present to many people, not just the general practitioner, but the pediatrician would be involved, those in the transitional phase, psychologists, dermatologists, gynecologists, and so on throughout their life cycle. Now, when we looked at our own data in our uh, uh, department, we found that those who were premarital, because the Sri Lankan married age is around 26, that uh, quite a number had oligomenorrhea, and hirsutism was the main reason why they did come to our tertiary clinics. But the, those with the classical features of PCOS was, belonged to the majority, and we reported this in the 469 cohort of a South Asian population, which is probably the largest number that has been reported to here hitherto. But what we would like to mention, getting back to Miss Sri Lanka, is we need to do some basic endocrine testing. And we need to do her FSH and LH when she's not on medication. And you can see she's really eugonadotrophic, but her LH is high. But not every woman with PCOS need to have a high LH. It's only about 70%. Her thyroids are normal, prolactins are normal, while the testosterone, which is often missed, needs to be measured. Because if it comes way over the top, we need to think of secondary causes. 17 hydroxyprogesterone is very expensive. Only if the testosterone is high, we would, I would recommend that it's done. Or there is consanguinity, and you have a suggestion that there can be non-classical CAH. Overnight dexamethasone suppression test is not by far the most sensitive or specific, but it's an easy test to do, rather than the more cumbersome 24-hour urinary collection. But doing the oral glucose tolerance test is, I think, extremely important. And here, the fasting levels were normal, but her two-hour values were grossly not normal for a 16-year-old. You need to take that also into account. And so were her lipids. Her scan showed the typical PCOS. Of course, it's a challenging task for the radiologist because um, ultrasound is not easy transabdominally, and we cannot do transvaginal in the premarital group. So ladies and gentlemen, she falls with the WHO type 2 of eugonadotrophic girl. So she's unlikely to be having supracellular masses, and she's unlikely to be having primary ovarian failure. And therefore, we need to also identify that she's having features of the metabolic syndrome. And as you can see, it's a worldwide problem, but there are ethnic variations. And the more recent international guidelines of which I was part of that group, which was led by Monash, uh, they did a very good survey of the stakeholders, particularly the primary care physicians and the patient groups from 56 countries. And it was determined that there's an average delay of two years before confirming the diagnosis. You can't hold the doctors responsible. It's the evolution of the disease, but you need to be mindful of the secondary causes as well. 
From a South Asian point of view, when we did a community prevalence 10 years ago and reported in the American Journal of Epidemiology, we found a 6.3% in an unselected sample, which was very significant. And the most important thing was they had irregular periods, and we did field ultrasounds, and those were polycystic ovaries, but hirsutism was not very evident in these girls. But the very most important thing was that they had a culture of silence, and that was encouraged by the teachers, the mothers, the healthcare workers who said, oh, this will settle down when you get married, or you know, some uh, very, rather weird kind of suggestion. If you look at the pathophysiology, it's a high LH secretion in most. FSH production continues, but it's low. And the androgen excess is of ovarian and not adrenal origin. And they have high estrogens, and we need to bear this in mind. Because this girl had dysfunctional uterine bleeding. And therefore, they run a risk of endometrial hyperplasia and cancer prematurely. And we need to bear this in mind, not so to ensure that they have regular periods. And also the fact that they have high fasting insulins and the hyperinsulinemia, it's a fairly complex cartoon, but just to see, focus on the left bottom, it's a peripheral hyperinsulinemia due to insulin resistance and the ovary remains sensitive to the high insulin. So the ovary keeps producing, uh, insulin acts like a cogonadotrophin and produces excess androgens. Also, the high insulin blunts the production of the binding globulin, and thereby these girls have the hyperandrogenism. And that's how high androgens and high insulins seem to be occurring together. And as I said, do not forget the endometrial hyperplasia as well as their metabolic derangements. So ladies and gentlemen, polycystic ovary syndrome and insulin resistance are interwoven, and we also need to bear in mind liver problems, NASH, and obstructive sleep apnea, and I'm happy to say that it was a group from Sri Lanka working in the UK who did, did a large data analysis and have reported it about these being actually real problems in these young women. So we need to be timely and accurate in diagnosis, stepwise process of explanation, not only to the girl, but all her, her mothers and parents, as well as it has to be patient-centered, lifestyle modification, and behavioral change, which all comes under primary care. And from a Sri Lankan point of view, our work clearly showed that they manifest at a young age, like what Miss Sri Lanka does, with irregular periods and hirsutism, as well as central obesity rather than global obesity. And acanthos is a very simple marker that can be utilized. And it's, there are significantly more insulin resistance. And we need to also bear this in mind that they can get gestational diabetes. And this, again, is a very frightening experience because it means it will perpetuate into the next generation. As I said, they can have many phenotypes, but the metabolic syndrome remains quite high. And HDL being low and high Sent waist circumference are some of the common manifestations in these girls. And the fact that even in the field, we found that totally the abnormal glucose tolerance occurs in about one in five at a young age, and their risk of it getting more and more is pretty high. So the odds ratios are high for all these metabolic problems. Therefore, the young Sri Lankan or the South Asian woman with community screening has been found to not only have the metabolic problem, but huge psychological problems which affects their quality of life. And therefore, you need to give due attention to it, trying to avoid medications because that will perpetuate the metabolic problem. So priority needs, her cosmetics have to be addressed. You have to regularize the menses. And the simplest is pharmacology with any form of the combined oral contraceptive pill you have to overcome the concerns that the mothers have and about safety issues, and also pay due attention to the metabolic problems, which should be essentially through non-pharmacological, and to min minimize external steroid exposure, and to counsel. Therefore, I would suggest that you need to also sometimes consider metformin, but that will have to be individualized, uh, particularly if you want quick results where they can then get on in life, but you don't have to give metformin for life unless they have impaired glucose tolerance. So again, we would encourage a weight loss of about 5 to 
there is no word to say that counseling is excessive, you need to do that perpetually. And also, they would be starting to ask questions of fertility because they have access to social media and they, they can be unduly affected by the fact that they think they cannot enter into marriage and reproduction. And also the fact that rubella immunity and you have to encourage them to actually have their babies fairly early in life. In terms of insulin resistance, it's not only the overweight girls, but even the slim girls with PCOS tend to have uh, the insulin resistance as a problem and you need to bear this in mind. And you should encourage them to have physical activity and this would mean there are um, uh, more recent reports because there are very few data on the importance of physical activity, but no doubt those are well in place. And you need to also keep in mind that these girls would have conversion from impaired glucose tolerance to frank diabetes and that conversion rate can be anything from 2 to 8 percent per year. So if you look at the overweight and obese girl with polycystic ovary, you need to appreciate that her manifestation would be worse and therefore to encourage weight loss is important, particularly the visceral obesity and also the fact that their reproductive features would be worse. And in fact, there is a theory that the androgens increases their craving for high-fat, carbohydrate-rich foods, and also whether the thermogenesis and the basal metabolic rates can be altered by them having high androgens. So need, these need to be borne in mind. So getting back to our lady, 10 years later, she's 26, and she's inquiring about her fertility because she's been married six months. She's gained overall 20 kilos and her priority needs are to address her fertility. And no doubt you have to encourage weight loss. Now she's frankly diabetic. She's no longer eye impaired glucose tolerance. So you need to have target uh, HbA1c's and also do you give her insulin or do you give her weight, encourage, weight losing medications, even things like the glyptines in addition to metformin if necessary until she conceives and also the fact that you had to really load her with folates. So in terms of obesity and reproduction, you need to appreciate that re reducing weight is very important and therefore, although there is limited data, on an individual basis, you have to encourage them, lifestyle modification, diet, and exercise. And that there is nothing saying that exercise is contraindicated before conceiving. And of course, I would withhold bariatric surgery prior to conception because these could be problems uh, because these are not well recorded in terms of uh, weight uh, of uh, bearing babies. So you have to empower them, sociocultural issues, a lot of counseling, as I said, and these are the issues, quality of life, body image, psychosexual, and in fact, we have a support group and the international guidelines, I would suggest you download them, which are easily accessible, clearly addresses these. So 11 years down the line, at 29, uh, sorry, 13 years down the line, she's married three years, no success with pregnancies, no contraception. She's still having features of metabolic syndrome. And do we, how, how do we at primary care level know whether she's actually ovulating, which you can actually ask for a mid-cycle ultrasound and can do a day 21 progesterone if she is menstruating. And of course, the gynecologist would be anxious to check the, her tubes as well as you must make sure that the, her partner's Seminal fluid is also checked out. So four years down the line, she has lost weight. She's off the pill, and therefore, I think we need to, now it's time to refer her for proper ART, and also whether you continue metformin. So to summarize, polycystic syndrome, please call it syndrome and not a disease, manifests early in our ladies, and you need to give time-appropriate interventions in the life cycle, Hormonal contraception is safe, and hyperandrogenism needs to be multi-pronged in care approach. And the metabolic screening is important. Use of metformin needs to be individualized. Evidence-based treatment for fertility and a life cycle approach. So thank you very much.